Welcome to Fort Vancouver National Historical Site. This fall, we're unable to hold this event safely, so we've put a group of our volunteers together to film a series of Park After Dark videos so you can learn more about people and places at Fort Vancouver. As we move into autumn, we hope you join us for this cozy evening. Fort Vancouver is a diverse community that includes Hudson's Bay Company officers, company employees, and their families. From 1825 to the mid-19th century, Fort Vancouver was regional headquarters of the Hudson's Bay Company's Columbia Department. In the 1840s, this became an important stop on the Oregon Trail. 1845 was an important year for Fort Vancouver, and it was an important year for the National Park Service. The fort you see today is a reconstruction built on the archaeological footprint of the original, which stood here until it burnt down in the 1860s. When the National Park Service began the reconstruction in the late 1960s, they decided to recreate the fort as it appeared in 1845. But why 1845? 1845 was a year of great change for this community. When Fort Vancouver was built 20 years earlier, this territory was home to indigenous people, tribes, and nations. British trading posts like Fort Vancouver dotted the landscape. The 1830s had waves of disease due to the increasing presence of trappers and settlers. By the 1840s, missionaries and American immigrants were crossing the Oregon Trail. These American immigrants formed a new government south of the Columbia River and challenged the Hudson's Bay Company's influence in the Northwest. At the same time, fur demand in Europe was on a decline and the Hudson's Bay Company focused its attention to agricultural production. 1845 was an exciting time to be an American in the Pacific Northwest. Also a challenging time to be a Hudson's Bay Company employee. It was also a time of threat for Native American people as their lives would change forever. This is our first episode in the video series, Park After Dark. Today we're going to learn about the garden. The planning of the garden would have been the first requirement for the Hudson's Bay Company to establish the fort. Hello, welcome to Dr. McLaughlin's garden. My name is Nancy Funk and I'm an interpreter here at Fort Vancouver. Um, I'm responsible for the volunteer activity for the uh, garden and the historic kitchen. Dr. McLaughlin uh, is the chief factor here at Hudson Bay Company. This was a fur trading fort, not a military fort. And he was responsible for what they called the Columbia District. And the Columbia District ran from Russian Alaska to Mexican California, from the Great Salt Lake to the Sandwich Islands. So, and it was all run out of right here at Fort Vancouver. As of 1845, uh, the Fort Vancouver, the fur trade was in decline and it became more and more important for the farming, uh, ranching, and gardening to take place because it was uh, more important than the fur trade. Yeah, it was important for uh, the Fort Vancouver to be self-sustaining as they also supplied other forts in the Columbia District and also they started in uh, commerce with supplying uh, the Russian American company in Alaska with uh, food, um, field products such as wheat, barley, uh, that sort of thing. Also with the uh, salmon that they would uh, dry and salt that would be uh, sent to the Sandwich Islands. During the late 1830s, uh, they also got into the dairy business. There were five dairies, three of them were on Sovie Island, the others were here. And it was a massive operation, the agriculture operation. It was extremely important to do seed saving in the garden. Also the preserving, uh, such as drying, salting, pickling, uh, was very important here, fermenting, to preserve the produce, not only the produce, but the fish and meat for the winter season. It was also used for the ships and also uh, sold to, uh, once again, the uh, Russian-American company and the Sandwich Islands. So what else I have for you that we've just recently dug up were some potatoes and corn, which is coming on right now. And uh, the potatoes would be kept in the root cellars that they had here. They even had one root cellar, was called a potato cellar, that they would store the potatoes in throughout the winter months. And it was located alongside the roadway here. Uh, and corn, um, we often think of nice fresh ears of corn. They would have the fresh corn, but they would also do parched corn or roasted corn or dried corn, which would then be milled and used uh, 
for all types of uh, porridge, um, cornbread, and just a meal that they would have to put into their, uh, to make cakes or things like that with. So talking about the root cellar and where it was located, let me just set these down for a second. The garden today is a half acre garden and it's located in the wrong spot. Where the garden was, was on the other side of the roadway, which is 100% accurate. The garden in the 1840s was approximately seven to eight acres, and it ran all the way out to the orchard. Today's garden is over half an acre. It's designed in the same uh, principles that the garden was. The paths aren't nearly as wide because the paths in the original garden were wide enough to have them bring a wagon down with, um, with water to water the garden. Our paths with this garden represents exactly what they did and grew in the garden in the 1840s. Another uh, couple interesting things that we grow in the garden um, is an Nicotiana or tobacco. Dr. McLaughlin did grow it here. It was well known that they would dry the tobacco leaves and put them in between the bales of the beaver pelts when they would ship them back to England to make beaver hats. It prevented the um, insects from eating holes in the pelts would make them useless when they got to England. Another interesting thing that we grow in the garden is cotton. Uh, most people have never seen cotton growing unless you live in the South or the Southwest, uh, but we've grown it. Dr. McLaughlin grew it and we want to stay accurate to what he grew. Um, we've had some success in some years we haven't, just as all farming and gardening is. Some other interesting things we have on the property is cardoon. Uh, which is a thistle in the thistle family. And we would eat the stalk uh, or the spine of the uh, leaf and not necessarily the choke, like you think of an artichoke, although they're in the same family. We also have pomegranates, dwarf pomegranates in the garden. We have fig trees in the garden with figs on them that they had. Uh, we had quinces that were very, very common in Europe in the 1800s. Most people don't know what they are. They think they're also an apple or a big pear or something like that. But we do use them and demonstrate them in the historical kitchen too. As you came through the garden today, you walked through the tunnel of hops. And the hops are just beginning to flower now. Um, and they'll be ripening up in probably about two weeks. It was used in distilling and also as a, a leavener. Uh, we have tested it and used it to make a leavening such as um, sourdough. Uh, for making bread uh, as like a yeast and it works very well. It kind of gives it a, just a tiny bit of a, almost a beer taste to the bread. We have uh, grapes that were noted to be here in front of, in fact, in front of the Chief Factor's house is a beautiful grape arbor. Um, and there's photographs from the 1850s that show exactly that scenario with the flowers and the grapes in the front of the Chief Factor's house. Um, they were, of course, seeded grapes at that time, but very, very tasty. As you've noticed, there's a lot of flowers in the garden, and Dr. McLaughlin did incorporate flowers into the vegetable garden. And uh, a lot of them that you see, these beautiful dahlias, um, they uh, noted that dahlias were brought from the Sandwich Islands. Uh, we have zinnias, um, we have all types of other um, flowers that in bloom right now that um, were in the garden. And we try to keep it as accurate as possible to what Dr. McLaughlin was growing in 1845. He was a very, very progressive agriculturist and did a lot of things um, that we do in the garden today with rotation of crops, um, using natural uh, fertilizers and that sort of thing. The orchard was very important here. Not only did they have apples for making cider um, or drying, they also had, they had pears and peaches and all types of fruit uh, in the summer months that they would dry or uh, make jams out and preserve for winter usage. And today there are even remnants of the apple trees that they have taken scions from the original apple trees that were planted here and are still growing today in the Vancouver area. By the 1830s, they had uh, more than 700 head of cattle, more than 400 pigs. So you can imagine how much they would have had in the 1845 era, which was becoming the decline of the fur trade. The furs were harder and harder to get. Things were changing in England. So it was very fortunate that they had such a huge farm, ranching, and garden process here at Fort Vancouver to maintain 
the whole operation. Um, it was self-sustaining, but also um, profitable for the fort and Dr. McLaughlin. Well, I've dallied here quite long enough. I need to get these vegetables into the kitchen so they can pre prepare the meals for Dr. McLaughlin and his guests. So I'm gonna take these in now.